I think that there are three current challenges in prostate cancer research. The first is uh, risk assessment and assessing a man's risk uh, during his lifetime. The second is it's a differential diagnosis and prognosis of aggressive versus non-aggressive cancer. And the other is developing new treatments for advanced disease, but also uh, working out how best to use existing treatments for best effect. And the reason that that's important, or those three areas are important, are the, the three key areas that affect a man's, uh, the, the outcome of a man's diagnosis of having prostate cancer. There are a number of risk assessment tools uh, on the, you know, effectively on the market that have been developed and validated. The problem we have with them is that they're not really in routine use. We hear from men what's important to them, so the idea of a, a simple uh, and effective risk, risk assessment tool is something that's high on the list. I think that the problem is no matter how complicated the maths or the science behind a risk assessment tool is, it's got to be very easy to use and interpret and that's what we've been aiming to do and we're working with a sort of group of a core group of scientists to help us to develop that. So the, the, the important thing is that there are a number of tools out there that we think would be useful and we're following the development of those, but actually what we want is something that is sort of suitable and, and, and sort of relatively easy. Now the reason for that is we would like to see that as being the first, almost the first port of call. So have a risk assessment um, done, and then that will take some men out of the system, so who do not need to be tested further or, te or don't need to be tested on a regular basis. There will be others who are fired into the system and they have the best treatments available. And then there'll be others, there's always going to be a great area in risk assessment. So we've been looking at what happens to those, and it's not a perpetual loop of coming back and getting retested with the same old test. It's about what additional tests might you need to help make the decision. So diagnosis needs to be improved in two ways. There needs to be a better way of diagnosing that a man actually has a prostate cancer in, a, in an easy way, but also that prognostically um, clinicians can understand whether or not that disease is going to harm that man in his lifetime and how best to treat it. So it, it's a very, very key role in, in, in the whole prostate cancer journey. Um, one of the biggest issues then is, can screening be developed? Is there a tool or a test that can be developed in the future that would allow screening for men? And, and that's a big policy question and it's a big policy challenge. We know the PSA test isn't effective for screening at a population level, but we believe there must be something out there in the future that can help men understand their risk of the disease and what they go, uh, whether they go on to have further tests and, and whether there's a way of um, diagnosing and detecting aggressive cancers or cancers that are likely to be aggressive in the future at an early stage so that we can reduce the deaths from prostate cancer. Added to that there's also monitoring treatment and we need to be able to follow whether a treatment's being effective or not. So at the moment it is purely based I think on PSA. We'll need to look at other biological markers or genetic markers that will determine whether a man is responding to treatment and get him off that treatment onto another treatment sooner. I think ultimately what I'd like to see is the diagnostic and prognostic test fitting in with the risk assessment tool so it wasn't sort of come in one week and have a risk assessment, two weeks later have the diagnostic and prognostic test. It's a sort of part of the whole package. Yes, you're at risk of prostate cancer or yes, you do have prostate cancer, it is aggressive and it will respond to this treatment. So the more knowledge we can get sort of as a, as a package, then it helps develop better treatments. The, the final gap in care is um, the support side, so at the moment treatments um, do come with side effects, um, many of those are unavoidable, but men can be supported sometimes from before the, the treatment starts to reduce the impact of that side effect, be that incontinence or erectile dysfunction, be that the psychological impacts of, of prostate cancer, fatigue, bowel incontinence, etc. Um, those support services which hold by the um, health providers exist, but men are saying that they're, they're not being directed towards them and they're not getting appropriate help at an early enough stage or any help in some cases. And that's a key gap that is, is easy to close. It's about joining up men with services. I also think that we do need to be looking at a uh, repurposing of existing drugs. So we've seen some evidence coming through where drugs that have been used for different cancers are sort of looking to be potentially beneficial in prostate cancer. That helps get those drugs to market cheaper, hopefully. They have less sort of, uh, of the, the sort of rigorous trials to go through because they've already gone through quite a lot of the safety testing. 
I think from a policy perspective, there are some really key areas. Um, we do need to um, really invest in research and advances in diagnosis and, and treatment and prevention, but we also need to use those advances, the advances that are coming through now, and translate that into the best possible care for men now. If we could ensure that every man across the country has the best available care today, we'd already see improvements in outcomes. If we can build on that by ensuring that new advances and that cost-effective new treatments are able to reach men quickly, then we'd see even better outcomes for men. And I think that's where we need to be focusing in the future.